So I'm here, uh, back at the house. I haven't gone anywhere. You knew that already. Um, so I'm recording um, what I think is going to be the last uh, video lecture for electrochemistry. Um, so I had planned about uh, four or five lectures on this, but um, like you all, I'm kind of starting to run out of steam a little bit here. So I'm just going to try and focus on um, what I think are the main points from the learning goals. Um, and I'm also going to post uh, an external video for you on uh, lithium ion batteries and um, uh, Teslas and how, how those things work. I think it's a really cool application of what we're learning right now. So anyways, first I want to review these chapter 18 learning goals. Um, we've done pretty good, uh, just those two videos I recorded previously um, at getting through these. So let's talk about that. So um, understand redox reactions and balancing reactions via the half method, right? That's largely review from chapter four, but um, we went through it. So know the basic components of an electrochemical cell, cathode, anode, salt bridge, and be able to do the cell diagram notation. All right. So we've done that and you can expect that for exam three. Um, so know the difference between a voltaic cell and an electrolytic cell. So basically they're the same thing, right? Except for a voltaic cell does a spontaneous reaction. So it supplies you with power. Um, and an electrolytic cell, you have to supply it with power to recharge it, okay? So uh, we did that. Um, be able to st uh, calculate standard cell potentials from standard reduction potentials and understand how a spontaneous uh, cell reaction is achieved. So remember, this is the um, equation where you do um, uh, cathode minus anode as uh, reduction potentials, so the E cathode minus E anode, where both reactions are written as reductions. If you balance the reaction as a redox, just remember you've got to take um, whatever reaction you flip and turn into an oxidation reaction, you have to, al you have to also change the sign um, of that redo uh, redox potential. Okay, so um, we talked about that. So, um, and then I and then the last two things we talked about in those videos, understand how standard reduction potentials indicate the strength of an oxidizing reducing agent. So we talked about that with the, um, the chart that starts with fluorine on top and ends with lithium all the way at the bottom. Um, so F2 is the best oxidizing agent. Uh, correspondingly, F- is the worst reducing agent. Um, and lithium plus is the best uh, excuse me, is the worst oxidizing agent, lithium plus, which means that lithium metal is the best reducing agent. Okay. So understand how that uh, chart works in the trends. And then the last thing that we talked about briefly, be able to interconvert cell potential gives energy and electrochemical work. So that was just given from um, a simple equation that you can uh, plug and chug away. And so uh, I think on this video, I should be able to talk about these very last um, three goals, and I'll come back here to these goals um, at the end of this video to make sure that we, we talk about everything. Okay, so um, very briefly, the first thing that I just wanted to talk about, this is kind of continuing from the previous lecture, um, how do we determine standard reduction potentials in the first place, right? I showed you this whole chart of reduction potentials, right? Here they all are. Well, how did we figure these things out in the first place, right? They're isolated half reactions. And you can't do an isolated half reaction. When you do a reduction reaction, there has to be an oxidation reaction that goes along with it, okay? Or vice versa. If you do an oxidation reaction, there has to be a reduction reaction that goes along with it. They happen in pairs. So to determine those standard reduction potentials, we use what's called the, um, the SHE, the standard hydrogen electrode. And um, the way the standard hydrogen electrode works, um, so this is kind of a cartoony version of this thing. So these, these things are typically like, you know, more compact. They look like your pH meter that can just go right down into the solution. Um, but these have um, one atmosphere of hydrogen gas pressure in uh, this glass device. Um, there's a center rod that comes through here that, as you can see from the line notation, is made out of platinum. So that's the actual electrode. The piece of metal is platinum. 
Um, and as H2 gas bubbles into this solution, um, it undergoes this reaction where uh, H2 gas here serves as the reducing agent. Um, so it's reduced to H2 plus, or conversely, you could think of um, the H plus. So there's also one molar H plus that's in this electrode, as you can see right there. Um, that serves as the oxidizing agent, reacts with those free electrons um, to make that H2 gas, okay? And so when this reaction um, is operated as an isolated half, it has zero voltage. So there's no potential in this reaction at all. And so what that means is this can serve as a cathode or an anode. And you notice my line notation here. If we think about this for a minute, okay, and we remember in our line notation, um, so you can see that this would have to be for the anode. And I'll show you why that has to be for the anode. And you notice now we've got two compartments here, right? Okay, so the double line makes my salt bridge. Um, and now this in here, there's two compartments. One's for the gas and one is for the solution. And that platinum again is the electrode. Okay, so I know this is the anode um, because, right, with the way we do these cell diagrams, we can always come up with a reaction and write it in the same direction um, that the notation is showing. And if I finish balancing this, H2 goes to 2H plus, plus two electrons. Um, so that's an oxidation reaction. So that means that's got to be written as, um, so this is the anode. But if we draw this thing up as a cathode, right, I'm just going to write it in reverse. So there's my salt bridge. H plus, that's one molar. Okay, and then there's H2 gas, one ATM, uh, excuse me, I should have just left that um, as is, like so, okay? Um, and then I can still put the PT right there. Oh, yes, 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 okay. And then double line, thank you, very good. So there is now as the uh, cathode, and then once again, if I write this reaction, as the line notation is showing, right, in this order, then I recognize that has to be a reduction reaction, a gain in electrons, which would make this the cathode, okay? And so here is a couple of um, pictorial diagrams that show you how you could use the standard hydrogen electrode. In this picture right here, um, it's working as the cathode um, because the zinc half uh, requires it to be that way in order to get a positive potential, right? So the standard potential of zinc is 0.762 volts, okay? Um, and so because it's zero minus whatever that value is, um, that value is actually negative 0.762 volts for zinc, right? So it would go zero volts minus negative 0.762 volts to give me positive 0.762 volts, okay? Um, or similarly, um, when it's paired up with the copper um, half, the standard hydroelectrode would have to be the anode, um, again, to give that a positive potential, okay? And because this half, whether it's the cathode or anode, it's zero volts, the voltage you would measure is strictly due to the other half. So we could change that hydrogen electrode as cathode and anode with any other half, um, and that's how those standard reduction potentials are determined, okay? Um, so that's all that I'm going to really say about that, um, because now what I want to do is move on to getting into the effect of concentration on cell potential, and this is going to get us to the very famous uh, Nernst, Nernst equation, okay? So first let's talk about this. So we, we talked about this equation um, in thermodynamics, delta G equals delta G standard plus RT times natural log of the reaction quotient, okay? And so we talked about how delta G, so that's the delta G for the entire process, um, and that would be the standard free energy of the reaction. And right, this assumes that everything is in um, standard, 
states. So for solutions, that would be one molar at 298K. For gases, that would be one atmosphere um, at 273K, right? So that would be our, all of our standard conditions, okay? So as it turns out, this delta G really represents our free energy um, when the situation is not at standard conditions, all right? So now we know um, from our previous lectures that delta G equals negative NF times E cell, all right? So to go from here to here, I just replaced that delta G with negative NF times E cell. This delta G is delta G standard, so then that means the E cell right here is the standard cell potential. And then we still have the RT natural log of Q. And now if we do some rearrangement, some algebraic rearrangement, so everything gets divided by negative NF, okay? So that cancels that negative NF, that cancels that negative NF, and then this makes this positive RT a negative RT divided by NF. And so now what this means is, here this is our observed cell potential for non-standard conditions, whatever our conditions were. This is the standard cell potential for those standard conditions. And now R, T, and F are all constants. N is the number of moles of electrons transferred. And then Q is going to be the ratio of the concentrations of products over reactants in whatever conditions they are to give us the observed cell potential. Okay, that was a lot. So we're going to go through a couple examples on this equation. So but first to show you, there are two um, different forms of this equation, and they're both identical, okay? And so I just want to point out that sometimes in literature, you'll see the Nernst equation written as this, where it's the E standard cell minus 0.0592 volts divided by N. This 0.0592 volts comes from R times T divided by F and converting a natural log to a base 10 LOG log. I'm not gonna ask you to do that. As it turns out, it's just a factor of 2.303. So keep that in mind. You can use this version of the equation um, when your temperature is exactly 298K, um, but you have to use LOG log. If your temperature is not 298K, then this is the best version of the equation to use, all right? So just note the, there's some subtle differences. So just make sure you are aware of the subtle differences in this equation, okay? So now here I have a sample problem and I realize I don't have any music ready at all to work on this while we're doing this thing, but that's okay. Let's just grind it out and work through this problem. So calculate the observed cell potential based on the following conditions at 298K. So here's what we have. We have two redox reactions, or we have two standard reduction reactions. Um, we need to make a cell out of them. So we need to make one of these an oxidation and keep the other as a reduction. And we want to do that in a way that makes them uh, positive. So I can already tell right now the way that I'm going to want to do that um, is by keeping the uh, top reaction as a reduction. Because if I flip this one, that will be positive, and one plus positive 0.76 makes a positive cell potential. But if I flip this one, that makes both of them negative, and that's no good. Okay, so let's work on this top one. So it's gonna go VO2 plus, plus 2H plus, plus electron, makes VO2 plus, so keep in mind, right, this is vanadium dioxide plus, this is vanadium monoxide, okay. Or, uh, excuse me, because these are transition metal compounds, this is vanadium three oxide, this is vanadium two oxide. That's the better way to say it, okay. Um, and then H2O liquid, and then we know that that's 1.0 volts. And so I know I want to flip that other one so that I can cancel the electrons and make it a positive cell potential. So that goes zinc solid, goes to zinc two plus, plus two electrons. 
and that makes this positive 0.76 volts. And now this is a really important step because to get the reaction quotient right, I have to balance this out correctly. And so I can see I've got two electrons here and only one electron here. So I'm going to want to multiply everything by two. So this becomes a two, this becomes a four, this becomes a two, two, and two. And so that allows me to cancel the electrons. That allows me to add this together to make 1.76 volt cell potential. And then my total cell reaction becomes 2 vanadium 3 plus, uh, excuse me, vanadium 3 oxide plus 4 H plus plus zinc. And then I'll remind us, right, that this one is solid. That's going to be important for our equilibrium situation. Um, zinc 2 plus, and then plus 2 uh, vanadium 2 oxide plus 2 H2O liquid. Okay, so now what I got to do is get the reaction. Uh, oh, and then uh, let's see here. Yes, very good. Okay, so we know that N equals 2 for my number of moles, right? And so I now need Q, the reaction quotient of this reaction. And remember, it's products over reactants, and we don't include pure phases like liquids and solids, okay? So that's going to go as, uh, let's see here, vanadium 2 oxide squared, right, times the zinc ion. I don't put water in the reaction quotient. So products over reactants. Um, so now that's H plus to the fourth power and uh, times, we don't include zinc solid, and now I've got to have vanadium 3 oxide all squared. <coughs> Excuse me. So now it's just plugging and chugging into my inertz equation. And I'm going to go ahead and calculate this Q value since I've got all those concentrations right there. So I can see that that's going to be um, for my uh, VO2 plus, that's 0.01 squared. My zinc 2 plus concentration is 0.1. My H plus concentration is 0.5 molar, and that's raised to the fourth power. And my VO2 plus concentration is 2 molar squared. And when I calculate all of that out, I get 4.0 times 10 to the negative fifth. Okay, so now I'm ready to use my inert equation that says E cell equals E cell standard minus, and because this was done at 298K, I'm going to use the 0.0592 volts divided by 2, which is the number of electrons it transferred, right? N is 2, times LOG log of 4.0 times 10 to the negative fifth, okay? And then I plug this in right here. This is a 1.76 volts that I got right there. So when I calculate all that out, I get 1.89 volts. Okay. So the whole point of this thing is that if we had created this cell with one molar of everything, everything being one molar, we get 1.76 volts. Okay. But if we use these concentrations instead, which some of them are less than one molar, almost all of them are less than one molar, which is really interesting, right? we actually get a higher cell potential, 1.89 volts, okay? So this Nernst equation, this is more like the practical um, way to calculate what a cell potential is or what it should be because hardly ever do we have things in standard conditions, right? Rarely do we have a 1.000 molar solution, okay? So we often have non-standard solutions which require us to use the Nernst equation, all right? 
So um, there's another type of cell that we could talk about, um, which is called a concentration cell, as indicated right here. Uh, right here, concentration cell. And the way a concentration cell works, the cathode and the anode are identical. Okay? S the only thing that's different is the concentrations. So you notice we have in the anode a 0.1 molar silver nitrate solution. Excuse me. But in the cathode, it's a 1 molar, so it's 10 times higher. So now I've indicated here that the electrons flow from anode to cathode. Electrons always flow from anode to cathode in a spontaneous cell. So, but how is it that they will flow when the cell compartments are identical? Okay. And the reason for that is it's actually called chemical potential. So there is more chemical potential on this side with the higher concentration than there is on this side. So those electrons, when those electrons are liberated from the anode, they're going to want to find a place to go. And this cathode has a far greater concentration, so, and they're positive silver ions, right? So they're gonna bring those um, electrons over from the anode. So in a concentration cell, the lower concentration is always the anode and the higher concentration is always the cathode. And I have an example here that's right the Nernst equation for this cell. Um, so the challenging part of doing that is um, getting Q, right? Getting the right uh, reaction quotient, okay? So if we've got the, um, I'll write the anode reaction as the following silver plus, and I'm going to say um, LC for low concentration in my anode, that's the oxidation reaction, and silver plus, uh, this is the high concentration that's in the cathode, that's the reduction reaction, all right, and so the way this works, the solid and the solid and the electron and the electron cancel, so you've got Silver high concentration goes to silver low concentration. And my reaction quotient would be products over reactants. So it's the silver low concentration divided by the silver high concentration. And when I go to set up the Nernst equation for that, E cell equals E cell standard minus 0.0592 volts divided by N times the log of silver plus low concentration divided by silver plus high concentration, okay? <laughs> so now why on earth would you ever do this? Would you ever make a concentration cell? Well, if you think about this for a minute, so suppose we still have our standard one molar silver solution in the cathode, okay? Suppose in the anode we didn't know what the concentration was. Uh, we'd have to know that it's less than one molar to be in the anode. But suppose that we didn't know this value, okay? So then what we could do is now, um, so if we've got my low concentration side and my high concentration side, and here I've got the salt bridge, and then here I've got electrons flowing, and I can measure that voltage, right? Some type of voltmeter, okay? So if I measure this, I know what this is going to be. Uh, it's actually going to be zero, right? Because these two reactions have the same potential, so they cancel out. So that goes to zero. But then now what you can do is if you measure the cell potential, you can figure out the unknown concentration. Okay? And this is exactly how chemists do quantitative analysis, how we determine quantitatively unknown concentrations by using these types of cells. And so if we wanted to measure for silver, we would make a silver probe. If we wanted to measure for copper, we would make a copper probe, okay? And those could be done by 
by making these cathode and anodes of the ion that you want to study. So there are a lot of these standard cells now, you can just go buy them from a store, right? You're not making these, you can just go and buy like a copper electrode or a silver electrode or a zinc electrode. Um, and so they, you know, there's limitations to these types of electrodes, right? But all the same, um, that's how we do quantitative analysis on unknowns, okay? So I'm gonna shift gears just slightly here and instead of recording um, another video, I'm just gonna keep going with this. Um, so this is probably a good place to pause and make sure that you're feeling okay. So let's just do a check on the learning goals. Um, be able to use the Faraday constant to calculate cell charge potential and how long it takes to recharge batteries. Geez, we didn't even do that. Oh, here we go. Be able to use the Nernst equation in cell potential calculations and equilibrium constants. Okay. Um, so in other words, so the last little thing, I'm glad I reviewed this because the last little thing I didn't say about this that would be really useful, right? Okay. So let's, um, there we go. So let's go back to this. Uh, let's go back to this equation here. Okay. Yes. So one thing to consider. All right, so E cell is what we always measure. That's our observed cell potential, right? This E standard cell is always calculated. And then I'm just going to say minus RT and F natural log Q. Okay. So what happens when this thing becomes zero? So when E cell equals zero, what happens? Well, the standard cell potential is not ever going to be zero unless we're doing a concentration cell like I just described. But for a, a typical voltaic cell, this is always going to have some value. However, this E cell value can get to zero. Okay. And basically, you have a dead battery at that point, right? You don't have a functioning battery anymore. It needs to be recharged. And so when that happens, Q equals K. So you achieved equilibrium. And so then that means it's zero equals E cell standard minus RT and F LN of K. All right, and so now what this means, we can come up with a cool equation. I'm going to do some algebra here on this, and I'm going to add this over to this side, and I'm going to divide out by those constants. Okay, so let's do that in one step. Um, so I've got natural log of K equals E cell. Okay, so I add that over to this side, and I divide out by those constants. So then that's, um, I got too sloppy with this right here. So let's write that above. Okay. So that's natural log of K equals N F E cell uh, divided by R T. And that's all negative. Okay. And then now if I take E of both sides, so that's K equals E raised to the power negative N F E standard cell divided by RT. So this is really cool. So this is another way that you can determine an equilibrium constant. So suppose you don't know what an equilibrium constant is, but you do know what a standard cell potential is. That would allow you to calculate the equilibrium constant. Um, there's also something I want to show you. I'll remind you that that quantity, um, where is it? Yes, negative NF E cell is delta G. So look what happens to this equation. It's really the same thing as the equation we learned in thermo. This is just K equals E raised to the negative delta G divided by RT. So it's the same equation, right? So all of this stuff is connected, okay? So that's where that learning goal comes from uh, right here. Be able to use the, the Nernst equation in cell potential calculations and equilibrium constants, all right? Okay, so moving on, let's talk about 
Faraday's constant and charging batteries. Okay, and so this will be the last main topic. There was a learning goal on there related to understanding um, some basic information. So know some basic information about nickel metal hydride batteries, lithium ion batteries, lead acid batteries, and hydrogen fuel cells. I'm not gonna do very much with this learning goal. I, I won't make you responsible for this learning goal on the exam, um, but I am gonna send you a video about lithium ion batteries that I do want you to watch because it's really cool. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, battery capacity and how this relates to being able to charge up our batteries. So first, a few units, okay? So we remember that work equals Q times E, okay? So that's a coulomb times a volt, right? Um, an amp is one coulomb per second. A coulomb is one amp second, and a volt is one joule per coulomb. So these are all kind of review a little bit. Um, another bit of review, a joule, or excuse me, one watt is one joule per second. And then finally, of course, one kilowatt is 1,000 joules. So there's a particular interesting unit um, that I want you to play with. One kilowatt hour, how many of this, and what units, okay? So let's play around with this for a second, and I'll tell you why after that. The kilowatt hour. So we recognize that a kilowatt is the same as 1,000 joules per second. So that's a kilowatt, which is 1,000 joule per second times hours. Okay. So one hour is 60 minutes. And one minute is 60 seconds. Okay? <coughs> Somebody say bless me. Okay. So now, um, so that's 3,600 seconds in an hour. So the minute and the minute cancel, and the hour and the hour cancel, and the second and the second cancel. So 1,000 times 60 times 60 gives you 3.6 times 10 to the 6 joules, which is the same as 3.6 megajoules. So why is that important? Well, as it turns out, PG&E bills you for the kilowatt hour. So this is how much electricity you use. You're using so many kilowatts of electricity for a certain period of time, right? So for example, if I use a 60 watt bulb, right, I turn on a 60 watt light bulb um, for one hour, you know, I'd have 60 watt hours of energy that I just used, okay? So that's how you get billed. Um, I believe tier one, so like the lowest tier is around 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So that doesn't sound like a lot, but, um, you know, in my house, we typically use around 400 kilowatt hours um, in a month. So, you know, point, uh, $0.12 times 400, um, 48 bucks. So that seems pretty reasonable. And, of course, that's like tier one. So if you go over a certain uh, amount, you go to tier two. And so that number gets more expensive. Okay. So I thought this was useful. So you should totally go to your PG&E bill. Look at your PG&E bill. See how many kilowatt hours you typically use in a month. Okay? Because you can relate that directly to joules. So now that's, that's a nice little uh, prequel into how we get into talking about uh, charging, how we charge our batteries. Okay? And there's one particular type of battery that I want to highlight here, the nickel metal hydride battery. That's these guys, these famous rechargeable energizers. Um, I'm going to give a little spiel here for just one second. I only use these kind of batteries in my house. I have a four-year-old. There's toys everywhere that I step on all the time, and they're all battery-powered. And, of course, my son, because he's four years old, he doesn't know any better. He leaves them on all night long, right? And then the battery runs out. Um, so we learned a long time ago as parents that not only is it really cheap and easy to have rechargeable batteries, it makes for a not upset kid when he's left like his remote control car on all night long, 
And it's like, oh, hey, look, we've got some batteries that are already charged up. Also, I think this is a really important environmental point that I'd like to make. And I'm going to play a video for you how these lithium ion batteries are created. Not um, nickel metal hydride, but uh, I'm going to give you a video on lithium ion batteries. But these nickel metal hydride batteries are manufactured very similarly. It's a really complex engineering process. Even those single use alkaline batteries that I mentioned before, just your regular old Duracell or Energizer non rechargeable battery, there's a lot of work that goes into making those things. And when you think about how easy it is to just accidentally leave something on, the battery's dead, and then we chuck it and throw it away. It's incredibly wasteful. These things are corrosive, they're nasty, they're bad for the environment. Um, so I want to really, really encourage you to buy rechargeable batteries only. I know they're more expensive, but consider that if you pay 10 bucks for a four pack of rechargeable batteries and you reuse them 10 times, you just saved $400, right? Or whatever the price of the four regular batteries are. If let's say they're eight bucks, you've saved, uh, I don't know, 320 bucks. It's huge, the amount of money you save just from doing these rechargeable batteries. And there is a really huge impact on the environment to not be chucking batteries away all the time. So anyways, spiel over, point made, buy rechargeable batteries only. I don't care how expensive they are, it is worth it. So anyways, here's how these things work, okay? They're called nickel metal hydride because there is a metal hydride. So if you think about this as a, in terms of an oxidation state, when we say hydride, we're talking about a hydrogen anion. That's very rare. So the hydrogen is the anion, and here we have a metal cation. We don't know what the metal cation is because it's proprietary. These companies are protecting that information um, because it's proprietary. They want to make money off of it, okay? So we don't know what that metal is. Um, so anyways, it's some type of metal hydride, okay? And so here in the cathode, You've got this nickel hydroxide compound, all right? And it's separated by this very, very thin potassium hydroxide electrolyte layer. So it's a plastic membrane that's been soaked in potassium hydroxide. You know, it's not like the beakers, like what all these pictures I've been showing you, okay? And so this nickel oxide um, is uh, reduced um, in the cathode right and releases a hydroxide and that hydroxide travels across the salt bridge over to the anode right remember anions have to flow from cathode to anode electrons flow from anode to cathode okay and here in the anode that's where you've got that metal hydride that will then react with that hydroxide releases that pure metal and gives the electron back to the cathode side and so these things are, um, they're, they're tiny. It's so crazy tiny. Uh, these anodes and cathodes in this uh, potassium hydroxide salt bridge. It's really impressive the amount of engineering that goes into making these things. And so that's why, again, it's incredibly wasteful to just chuck these things, right? When you think about how much effort goes into making them. And you get about 1.2 volts from your typical nickel metal hydride battery. And so these can be triple A's, double A's, C battery, nine volt. Um, so they can make these in any variety. So now I have a cool problem to work through, a uh, practical application here. Um, so, and uh, we should work through this. Again, I forgot to have music ready for the uh, working out the problem, but let's just work through this, okay? So if a battery charger for a double A, that's nickel metal hydride battery, supplies a charging current of 1.00 amps, that's way too large, by the way, that would fry your battery, but for the point of this uh, exercise, let's just go with 0.1 amp, or 1 amp, uh, 0.1 amp, or 0.01 amp is more realistic, okay? But anyways, let's just do 1 amp for the calculation. So how many minutes does it take to recharge the battery? You may assume a typical nickel metal hydride battery has approximately 8.6 grams of nickel hydroxide when it is completely dead, okay? So this is a hard problem. This is a really hard problem. And I'm gonna work this uh, out for you. And so the first thing we wanna do is um, balance the two halves so we can see how the electrons uh, flow, okay? So in the anode, there's the metal hydride, MH, plus hydroxide, and that releases our unknown 
proprietary metal. Plus H2O plus electrons. So there's our oxidation half that I got from uh, right here, right? Metal hydride plus hydroxide makes metal solid plus H2O plus electron. And so as you can see, my cathode, it's written right there, so I'll just keep this up here. Um, that's going to go as NiOOH. Um, okay, so that's a, a nickel oxide hydroxide plus H2O plus electron. And that's going to make my nickel hydroxide um, and release some additional hydroxide. And so again, you can see that it's fairly well balanced. It's a one electron, one electron system. So I'm not going to worry about balancing anymore. I can see that that's good. And um, when I'm reading on this problem here, it says we may assume that there's 8.6 grams of this stuff when the battery is dead. Okay. So that means as this thing is going, right? my anode is giving up an electron and supplying it to the cathode. And so all of this nickel compound is then getting uh, reduced into this nickel hydroxide. So when this has now gone completely in this direction, I'm gonna say uh, discharge going in this direction, that means we're using it. When a battery is discharging, we're using it. Okay. And so now what that means is to charge the battery, I'll use a different color here. I've got to go back. I got to convert this nickel hydroxide compound back to this nickel oxide hydroxide compound. So that's where we charge it by sending it back the other way. Okay. So how many minutes does it take to recharge the battery when it's completely dead? So this is kind of challenging on where to start. So that's why I drew this picture out, okay? And um, so what we want to do is start, like any good stoichiometry problem, start with the first number you're given. Uh, or start with like the first quantity you're given, 8.6 grams of nickel hydroxide. And I need to convert that over into this NiOOH, okay? And I'm going to do that based on moles. So um, I get the molar mass of this, and that's 92.7 grams of nickel hydroxide in one mole, okay? And I know from here that one mole of this nickel compound requires one mole of electrons, okay? So, or another way to think of this is one mole of nickel hydroxide reacts to form one mole of nickel oxide hydroxide, which reacts to form one mole of electrons. All right. And so when I do that calculation, I get 0 0.093 moles of electrons. So it would also have been the same 0 0.093 moles of nickel, but my 0 0.093 moles of nickel needs 0.093 moles of electrons because it's a one to one electron to nickel ratio. And then now what I can do with this moles of nickel, here's where I'm going to use uh, Faraday's constant. Okay. Because now I know from Faraday's constant, so I'll write that down. F equals 96,485 Coulomb per mole of electron. That's Faraday's constant. So now here I can say one mole of electrons is 96,485 Coulomb, okay? So up here, they told me that I had one amp. Well, 1.0 amps, all right, let's check our units. One amp is the same as one Coulomb per second. So my 1.00 amps equals 1.00 Coulombs in one second, okay? So then now, up here, I've got 0.093 moles of electrons. and one mole of electrons, there's 96,485 Coulomb. From right here, I can say there's 1.00 Coulomb in one second. And then finally, I know in 60 seconds, there's one 
minute. And it's as simple as that. Moles and moles cancel, coulomb and coulomb cancel, seconds and seconds cancel, and I'm left with minutes. Um, and when you go and calculate that out, you get 150 minutes. Okay. So now I talked about um, earlier, I said this 1.0 amps is not realistic. That's a, that's a big current. That would generate a ton of heat. Um, and it would likely lead to degradation of these batteries. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of details of like, well, why is one amp too much? And, you know, why is 0.01 amps okay? So I think that's more appropriate for like an electrical engineering class. Um, but if you have some uh, battery chargers at home, if you have some of these Energizer batteries, look at that charger and uh, see what its capacity is. Mine is more like 0.1 amps. So instead of this being 150 minutes, it would be 1,500 minutes, 1,500 minutes, right? And that 1,500 minutes is roughly 25 hours. And that makes sense. I know anecdotally when I put a completely dead battery in my battery charger, it takes like a full day for it to charge. And that's not a limitation of the battery or the charger. It's more of just a limitation of not overcharging it not overheating it we could charge it much faster if we wanted to but those little batteries just can't handle it as well um, as it turns out lithium-ion batteries can um, and i have a fantastic video that's going to give you some more information about the lithium-ion battery and explain all that good stuff to you so here i have the reaction um, pictorially right here um, and so and, and so i'll just describe this really quickly um, and then you should watch this next video that I'm going to post because it is really cool. This is definitely the future of battery technology. So what we have here in, so we have cathode and anode. The cathode is this cobalt oxide compound and the anode is graphite. Um, technically single layers of graphene make up the anode. Okay. And so you notice this formula Li1 minus X cobalt oxide, and then LiX, okay? X equals one in a fully charged battery. So in a fully charged battery, your anode has all these little lithium ions sitting in that space in the graphene. So if you remember, um, graphite, right, has these honeycomb carbon network. Okay, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. I did that terribly blah. so i'll just draw it like this okay so that's one of our graphites and so it has uh, this electron density that i'll draw like around as a circle okay there's a resonance structure around there and so this lithium ion can just fit in that little pocket really nicely it's kind of cool and because it's so small it's such a small little ion so when this is fully charged Right, one minus one is zero. So that means there's no lithium on the cobalt oxide. It's all over on the anode. Well, X equals zero when it's fully discharged. So when the battery gets used, as this lithium migrates over from anode to cathode, so too does an electron. The electron follows it because it's a positive charge moving. Um, so this diagram just shows you the lithium ion moving, but right, that electron moves with the lithium ion, okay? And that's what creates the electron moving from anode to cathode. Um, so that's pretty much all I'll say about this. Um, there's several other slides I have here about the lead acid car battery. I have something cool about hydrogen fuel cells. Um, I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to talk about these too much. If we had time, if the semester was going as usual, I would get into this and talk about these. But... Um, but I think this is pretty much, I think the lithium ion battery is going to take over all this stuff anyways, right? I mean, you could power an entire car with a lithium ion battery. That's what's in the Tesla is these lithium ion batteries. And not only can you power an entire car with lithium ion batteries, you can turn it into a race car, right? Tesla is some of the fastest cars out there. Um, and it's completely driven by lithium ion batteries. Um, so anyways, watch that short little video that I post next. Um, this will be it for electrochemistry. So just one quiz on electrochemistry. 
Um, and then we had the exam coming up. So don't forget about that. I'll send a separate email, maybe video description about that. Uh, all right, folks.